Welcome back to the channel, folks. Each generation of gaming has its fair share of underrated titles, with the seventh gen of consoles probably housing most of my favorite underappreciated gems. There's the cheeky, hack and slash, zombie killing fun of Lollipop Chainsaw, the refreshing take on a World War II setting found in the Saboteur, or the unique blend of supernatural horror and first person shooting found in the subject of today's video, The Darkness. Based on the comic book series of the same name, created by Mark Silvestri, Garth Ennis, and David Wall, The Darkness was developed by Starbreeze Studios and published by 2K Games, dropping back in 2007. It was one of those games whose box art would catch my eye when I dropped into GameStop to browse or get ripped off when I traded in my old games. I still hate myself for trading in my copy of Pokemon HeartGold all those years ago. Though it wasn't until a few years later, when I learned how to hack my PS3, that I decided to give the game a shot and I rented it from Gamefly. And I thought it was pretty fun. I really liked its setting and found the darkness abilities a unique and interesting way to spice up the usual first person shooting. However, I never got around to playing the sequel and I haven't replayed the original until now. So let's see what made the game so underrated and if it still holds up today. But before I continue, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Upside. One of my New Year's resolutions was to be more fiscally responsible and try to spend smarter. Upside is a free app that shows you the best offers in your area for daily essentials, such as grocery shopping, getting gas for your car, or when you go out to a restaurant. Opening Upside, I saw I could earn 50 cents per gallon back in cash and all I had to do was hit claim deal. And I managed to get another $2 back when I went to Dunkin' Donuts for a coffee run. These aren't reward points or credits either, but actual cash you're getting back that can be sent straight to your bank account. With over 100,000 locations across the U.S. available on Upside, you'll have no shortage of offers while using the app. It's simple to use and set up. Just download Upside, create a free account, claim an offer, and then spend like normal. Top Upside earners are making as much as $300 a month. To find out how much you could earn, scan my QR code on the screen, or click the link in the description to download Upside, and use code FUZZYSLIPPERS to get an extra $0.25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. Thanks again to Upside for sponsoring today's video. As I mentioned in the opening, The Darkness is an adaptation of the comic series published by Top Cow Productions and Image Comics. The game is a rather loose take on the first volume of the series that spanned 40 issues and ran from 1996 to 2001. The series follows the story of Jackie Estacado, a mobster and hitman for the Franchetti crime family who becomes the vessel for an ancient entity known as the Darkness on his 21st birthday. As he begins to understand his new demonic powers, Jackie will face off against rival mobsters, other supernatural beings, crossover with other series like Witchblade and even Batman, till he eventually butts heads with his uncle, the Don of the Franchetti family. The game trims down the story, removing some of the other supernatural elements and entities, keeping most of the supporting cast and focusing more on Jackie's war with his uncle. I've never read the comics until I decided to do this video, and I only really went through about 10 issues before I started writing the script. For the most part, I was digging the story, the art is pretty solid, and I think I might prefer the comics version of Jackie over his video game counterpart. It's not essential reading to understand the game's story since so much has changed, but it's a pretty decent read if you have some free time. Outside of what I just mentioned, the big omission from the comics that doesn't appear in the game is Jackie's darkness armor, though it does pop up in the sequel. For the most part, I'm not going to bring up much about the comics outside of a few differences between it and the game. I remember the night of my 21st birthday. That was the first time I died. It's the Cotto! Oh, it's the Cotto! Come on, wake up, sunshine! Oh, now up here, you boomba! Come on, look at me! What's the matter, you pussy, huh? Get one little baby dad from a nightclub bouncer, you go to sleep on me over here? Hey, I already told you, he don't look so good. That guy was a goddamn gorilla. Ugly too. Oh, he's gonna rip my nuts off. He finds out we never collected his money. The darkness begins on the 21st birthday of our lead, Jackie Estacado. Jackie works as a contract killer for his uncle, Paulie Franchetti, the Don of the Franchetti crime family. The fact he's specifically named as a contract killer might explain why Jackie looks less like your typical mobster and more like your average metalhead. While it suits this version of Jackie, honestly, I prefer his more stylish look from the comics. 
He at least sounds like a badass mobster. With Jackie's voice provided by Kirk Acevedo. Though his appearance and voice do make it hard to believe he's only 21 years old. Riding with his two associates, Mikey and Nino, Jackie has been given a contract to take out a foreman working at the Gravesend construction site. What should be an easy hit job goes south fast when the trio get attacked by other mobsters and the cops. As the trio shoot back and try to lose their pursuers, Nino bites it when he decides to hang his head out of the car. During a high-speed chase through traffic, and the inevitable happens when his head smacks against the back of a truck. Jackie and Mikey manage to hold on a little longer before they reach a dead end and crash the car. Gravesend construction site. Happily named. Classic mob venture filled with blue-collar construction workers armed to the teeth. And my boss, Uncle Paulie, sent me here to whack the foreman. Like I said, classic. While Jackie manages to dust himself off, no worse for wear, Mikey wasn't so lucky. The combo of his busted leg and all the blood he's losing means he's not long for this world. I don't know what your relationship is to Jackie, but thanks for getting us your pistols, Mikey. I'll put them to good use. Getting proper control of Jackie, you'll notice something about the game's HUD. Mainly that it doesn't have one. No health bar, no objective marker, or compass pointing you in the direction you have to go. Nada. While technically the game will show your ammo count and whatever gun you have equipped, it only flashes that briefly when swapping firearms or reloading. Same thing with the save icon or when your objective updates, but for the most part, there isn't a HUD constantly displaying information. I've mentioned it before when discussing the getaway and dead space, but I love it when developers avoid cluttering the screen with too much information. Not only does it open up the doors to get creative when displaying things like your health or ammo, but it removes distractions making the world more immersive and really letting you take in your surroundings. The lack of a HUD also does a lot to make the player engage with the world to figure out what to do or where to go, but I'm going to circle back to that point after the tutorial section. Moving through the construction site, the workers are less than welcoming when seeing Jackie, and will start shooting him. Huh, guess they know he's here to kill their boss. Man, I gotta tell you, I didn't notice it at first, but something about the shooting in this game felt really off. Especially after I got better guns and got into bigger shootouts. Since this is a console-only game, at first I thought the analog stick aiming was the issue, but it's not. The controls feel responsive, the red laser sight makes it obvious where I'm aiming, I can zoom in for more precise shots, and it has some aim assist that makes it easier to go for headshots. Shooting is functional, but it doesn't feel great. Like enemies react when I shoot them, but there's a lack of power when using stronger firearms, so I don't feel stronger when I pick up a shotgun as opposed to a pistol. I don't know if this is because I'm coming off of playing Max Payne, which, thanks to my comments section, I'm now learning I made things more difficult for myself by not capping the frame rate. But shootouts feel so sluggish here. Part of it is because Jackie feels a bit sluggish himself, since he can't sprint or increase his movement speed. But trading bullets with other mobsters lacks the intensity I'm used to. They can certainly kill my ass in seconds if I get careless, but sometimes their brains break and I can just walk up to them and shoot them easy. It feels less like dangerous and intense shootouts where one wrong move means I'm done for and have to keep moving or use cover, and more like my friends and I playing pretend at recess, calling out our shots and arguing about if we shot each other or not. You can pull off these stylish execution moves when you get up close to someone, but they're way too risky to pull off when fighting bigger groups, and admittedly I pretty much forgot I could do them like halfway through the game. I don't hate the shooting, it's serviceable I guess, but because it's so lacking, you'll end up ignoring it once you've unlocked your full darkness power set. Continuing through the Gravesend construction site, Jackie will find the foreman's office and a message from his Uncle Polly, wishing him a happy birthday. Hey, it's your Uncle Polly. You know you've been a pain in my ass since the day I met you, Jackie. Pissing and moaning about the way I do this. Well, you need to learn who's calling the shots in this family. I've been very, very generous to you, Jackie. In fact, I got a surprise for you. On your very bed. It's in the closet. Have a blast.
Me and Paulie never did agree about the way things were being done. Paulie took the business into selling drugs, working side by side with the cops. When I was growing up, the family had codes. We did business. We looked out for the people. I believe we ought to honor those codes. Now, Paulie, he's just a parasite. Wants to bleed me dry. During loading screens and after certain story beats, Jackie will occasionally go into monologues that are kind of framed like he's in a stage play and like he's directly addressing the audience. He'll fill us in about where his mind is at, his thoughts and events that just happened, or what he has to do next and the backstories of various characters and his relationships with them. Or sometimes Jackie will tell some funny stories about characters who aren't in the game and have no importance to the plot. I dig it. It's an interesting way to flesh out and explore Jackie's character when he's alone, as opposed to having him just think out loud while he's running around a level. Nearly surviving his uncle's explosive gift and realizing he was set up, Jackie needs to leave the area fast. He'll eventually wind up at the Trinity Cemetery. Unfortunately, his only way out is blocked, and Jackie is cornered when his uncle's goons show up to finish him off. Then this happens. Like I mentioned before, quality of the shooting aside, you're playing this game for one reason. To tear people apart with your sick demon powers. Like his comics counterpart, the darkness is an ancient demonic being that's been passed down from generation to generation within the Estacado family. The entity makes itself known on the firstborn male's 21st birthday. This eldritch symbiote creature has its own will and agenda. Its creepy voice in this game provided by Mike Patton, lead vocalist of the band Faith No More. There's a lot more to the Darkness's origins and its goals that weren't brought over from the comics, the game keeping most information about it rather vague. There's also certain limitations that come with being the vessel of the Darkness that isn't touched on in the game. For example, Jackie can't have sex anymore. As if he fathers a child with a woman, the Darkness spirit will move on to his heir and instantly kill Jackie. Which is a bigger issue for comic Jackie since he was a womanizer and constantly sleeping around before the Darkness awakened. And I guess using condoms, birth control, or just pulling out won't work for whatever reason. I haven't read the entire comic run and I'm going off summarized info I found on fan wikis, so there might be some way around it. There's more differences between the two versions of the entity and its power set, but I'll leave it at that for now. Going back to the game's version of the darkness, when activated these pair of demonic serpent heads will sprout out of Jackie, making him more durable and giving him a healing factor, which gives an excuse for the game having regenerating health, as opposed to using health pickups to heal though Jackie still regains his health even if the darkness isn't active. To best utilize his new powers, Jackie needs to stay out of direct light, which is most efficiently done by just destroying whatever the nearest sources of light are. When manifesting his powers, Jackie will enter darkness mode, which allows him to see in the dark and see these little demon portals, along with giving him a darkness shield that buffs his defense and lets him take more damage. Using his demonic abilities or taking damage will drain Jackie's darkness energy, preventing him from using his powers until he returns to some shade. Effectively working like mana or a magic meter, how much darkness energy you currently have is indicated by the colored eyes on the demon heads. When you're running low, they'll instantly start sucking up the darkness in dim areas until your energy is completely replenished. However, if you stand in the light when darkness mode is active, your little pals will start to sizzle and lose energy, despawning completely once they're out of juice. As you progress through the game, you can increase Jackie's darkness level, which increases his max darkness energy and lets him use his abilities far more often before he has to recharge. Though the only way to increase your darkness level is by devouring the hearts of your falling enemies. While metal as fuck, especially when you see the animation of one or both of your demon heads chowing down on a heart, this can feel tedious and slow things down as you go around eating hearts. Mostly because you can't devour multiple hearts in one go, forcing you to eat them individually and watching the animation every single time. Thankfully, you only need to eat like 180 hearts to reach the max darkness level, 
So I didn't have to worry about eating every single heart after that. Though they're still useful in instantly refilling your darkness energy, as opposed to waiting for it to regenerate in the shade. Now that we know the mechanics of how this demonic entity works, what can we actually do with it? Well, for one, if you approach one of these tentacle demon portals, you can summon creatures called Darklings. These little gremlins will help Jackie in fights with four different types you can unlock over the course of the game. The first one you have access to is the knife-wielding berserker, who will get in close and personal to stab enemies to death. Your control over Darklings is limited, only being able to direct where you want it to move. They're also rather squishy and will despawn after taking a few shots or standing in direct light too long. While you can't have multiple versions of the same Darkling type active at once, you can run back to their portal and resummon them when they die. Also, I'm not quite sure what your party limit is with the Darklings. As official information and during certain parts of the game, I'm only allowed to have two different types active. Though later sections, I can move with a full crew of four Darklings, which may be due to what's happening in the story during those sections. Overall, I think the Darklings are pretty neat. Outside of fights, they'll point out places to search for hidden items, sometimes hint at what to do next if you're lost, and occasionally use their abilities to complete an objective. Also, you can dress up the basic Berserker Darkling with outfits you find throughout the game. I'll talk about the other Darklings when they pop up in the story, but for now let's move on to your actual Darkness abilities. You unlock four over the course of the game, with the color of your Demon Buddy's eyes changing to reflect what power is active. The first one unlocked is Creeping Dark, where Jackie can send out a smaller serpent version of the Darkness. With it, you can scout an area, crawl through vents to reach blocked rooms, collect hidden items Jackie can't get to, or to stealth kill enemies. While versatile, it drains darkness energy while active, and will instantly return to Jackie when it runs out. It's also squishy and will despawn if shot at, so it's not that great offensively. And because it can crawl up walls, it can be a little disorienting to control it at first. While an okay starter power, it gets outclassed fast when you unlock your more combat-focused abilities, but like the Darklings, I'll talk about those powers when they show up later. Clearing out the remainder of Uncle Polly's goons and escaping the cemetery, Jackie heads into the subway as he plans his next move. Yo, Jackie! It's me, Enzo! Wait up! I hear you pissed off your Uncle Polly. Put his boys out to look for you. You knock bones with one of his girls or something? I wasn't sure where was a good place to put this, but I want to talk about Jackie's uncle, Polly Franchetti. As Don of the Franchetti family, he isn't Jackie's biological uncle. Instead, he adopted Jackie when the kid was an orphan growing up at St. Mary's Orphanage. Polly would bring him into the mob life, and according to Jackie and some other characters you meet, the guy wasn't always an asshole. Once upon a time, he was an honorable mafioso who respected the old traditions and actually cared for his nephew. However, when he rose to become Don of the Franchetti family, all the power and money his new status afforded him would end up corrupting him. Polly developed a short temper that made him brutally attack others for the smallest of slights, giving him a reputation as a psycho. He'd ignore the Mafia code and start working with the police, paying them off to help with his dirty work, a move Jackie is very critical of, as he believes the Mafia shouldn't work with the cops in any capacity. So originally I thought Polly wanted Jackie dead to prevent him from manifesting the darkness, and potentially becoming a threat to his rule, but nope, he didn't know shit about his powers. Polly marked his loyal nephew and one of his best hitmen for death, solely because Jackie was criticizing his methods. Man, what a petty piece of shit. Going back to the topic of the darkness, but for a good chunk of the game, barely anyone acknowledges this thing's existence. Jackie included. Like he's more fixated on his war with his uncle than trying to figure out what the hell this demon inside of him is. He never really tells his associates who help him throughout the game about it either. The few people who do know about it don't really treat it like it's this big thing either. Acting like Jackie's darkness abilities is just a neat trick. Like, if this was something more common in this setting, I'd kinda get it. But it's weird that everyone is so blasé that there's a guy running around controlling an eldritch abomination. Guess that's New York City for ya. Now that we've reached the subway, this place will serve as a hub connecting the various locations Jackie will be visiting. Though this isn't the most inviting of places, as it's a bit run down and dirty, with graffiti on the walls and public restrooms that haven't been cleaned since who knows when. Throw in the green tint that's applied while you're down here, and it perfectly captures the miserable experience of riding the New York subway. Though rather surprisingly, all the people you'll bump into down here are fairly normal. Some of them genuinely nice too. The NPCs walking around aren't just window dressing to make the station feel more alive, as some will ask for Jackie's help. For example, this homeless fellow is being harassed by some schlub who won't let him play his harmonica, unless he coughs up some cash. Alrighty, let's talk to this guy. Yeah. My problem is I'm a big music lover, and I don't got no music to listen to. Now my buddy with the harmonica, 
He's an honest-to-God virtuoso. So my suggestion is that you leave him alone and let him do his thing. And if I don't? Well, if you don't, I got a magic trick for you. I see you around here again, dipshit. I'll put my arm down your throat and pull a rabbit out your fucking ass. Just relax, all right? You can play down here if you want. These little diversions to help out the citizens of New York are basically side missions, which, while rarely difficult or time-consuming, aren't particularly rewarding. Outside of the extra hearts you can devour during the more dangerous requests, all you ever get is a piece of paper that will unlock extra content, which you redeem by heading to a payphone and dialing the number you just received. Normally, it'd be more critical, but I think the side missions here are fine. They're simple, can be completed relatively fast, occasionally have you interacting with some interesting characters, and I'm a sucker when you can unlock stuff like concept art, trailers, or music in a game. Hell, you can unlock some issues of the comic book here too. Though I'm not sure if this is the most optimal way to read them. I'm not really going to discuss any of the side missions I did, but I might bring up a few here and there for comedic effect. Receiving a page from Jackie's girlfriend Jenny, she wants to properly celebrate his birthday and invites him to her new place in Chinatown. Crossing the platform and heading back up to the streets, after clearing another wave of Uncle Polly's goons, we're left to figure out where Jenny lives. Like I mentioned before, the game doesn't use objective markers to tell you where to go, and while it does technically have a map, it's a basic map of New York and it doesn't display your current surroundings or your position on it. So without the modern conveniences of GPS or yellow paint telling you where to go, we'll need to find our way the old-fashioned way. By using the directions Jenny gave you and examining your surroundings to know where you are and what way to go. And again, I really like this. The game is forcing me to engage with its world to figure out what to do, and it's not stupidly obtuse either. Just read the street signs, or check the convenient city maps dotted around the area that do show your current position. Like I said earlier, I'm not going to go on a tirade about modern game design, but finding out where to go or what to do on your own is way more fulfilling than just following a marker on the map. It makes exploring a game's world actually feel like exploring. I understand the worry about frustrating the player, but at least let them try. Though, admittedly, my dumbass did get lost trying to find Jenny's apartment. But hey, that's part of the fun. Tacky! Oh my god. Can you believe this place? Come here, look on the kitchen table. Surprise! Cake! <laughs> You won't believe this. Look, John Carlos spelled your name wrong again. <laughs> oh, baby girl, you're too good to me. Jenny is Jackie's childhood sweetheart, the two of them having grown up together at St. Mary's Orphanage. She's completely oblivious to the life that Jackie lives, unaware how serious his beef with his uncle actually is. If you choose to have Jackie tell her the truth and that he's a contract killer, Jenny doesn't even take him seriously and assumes he's making up a story to cover up whatever he's actually dealing with. She's far too innocent to the goings-on of the world, but that's probably why Jackie loves her. Jenny keeps him grounded, helps him forget the dark things he does, and like he can live a normal life. I guess you could say that Jenny is the small light in the seemingly endless darkness of Jackie's life. Trying to get her boyfriend to chill for a bit, she invites Jackie to sit and watch a movie before he calls and meets up with his friend Butcher, which is our next objective to proceed with the story. If you decide to stick around and spend some quality time with Jenny, you can take in the timeless movie classic To Kill a Mockingbird. Like the actual movie from 1962, and not just snippets of it either, but the entire movie from beginning to end. I wonder if there's someone out there who first watched this movie while playing The Darkness, and this is their preferred way to watch it. DVD? Streaming? Nah, no thanks. I can only enjoy this movie about the racial inequality of 1930s America, by booting up the 2007 game The Darkness on my Xbox 360. Also, I think it's funny that Jenny's idea for a romantic movie night with her boyfriend is to watch The Kill a Mockingbird of all movies. After she falls asleep, Jackie will give his buddy Butcher a call. He's heard about the crazy night Jackie's been having, warns him to be careful, and instructs him on how he can sneak into Butcher's shop to meet him. Hopefully this guy can offer some support. If there's one untouchable in this business, it's Butcher Joyce. You put out a hit on some guy, Butcher flushes his body. No one's ever the wiser. Butcher knows everyone's business. But what keeps him alive 
is that he never, ever chooses a side. Yeah. Too bad there's a war coming. Butcher Joyce is a cleaner, hired by the various mob families to dispose of bodies they don't want traced to them. While technically a neutral party with no loyalty to one person or group, he has no issues helping out Jackie in his war with his uncle. Butcher explains Jackie can only survive if he takes out his uncle first, suggesting that he attack Polly's businesses. If Polly takes enough of a financial hit, his associates in the Chicago mob families, who don't like him, and only put up with him because of the money he makes, would finally have a reason to cut ties with Polly and would move to whack him. Butcher tells Jackie to take out Polly's biggest earner, a guy called Dutch Oven Harry, who deals drugs out of his place in Hunter's Point. Before Jackie can get to this guy, Butcher's restaurant gets raided by the police no doubt on his uncle's orders. This section fighting them isn't hard, but it is kind of annoying, mainly because of all the lights everywhere. Since creeping darkness doesn't get much mileage here, you're only really using your darkness power for the health buff. So in order to actually use it and keep it active, you have to stop a lot to take out light sources as trying to just bum rush the SWAT officers will get you killed fast. I don't know, maybe there was a smarter way to deal with these guys and I only really died once, but it just felt like a slog having to take them out since I didn't have any options outside of just shooting. After escaping the boys in blue, Jackie will sneak through a rundown pool hall and into a rundown alley where Dutch Oven Harry is set up. Talk to and give some cash to the local drug addict and he'll tell Jackie where to find the guy's operation and the code word to use to buy some smack. Getting inside, Harry isn't there, but his number two, Roach, is who receives a call from his boss who tells him to take out the unexpected guest who is about to show up. No prizes for guessing what happens next. After squashing Roach and killing everyone here, Dutch Oven Harry calls to see if Jackie's dead. You can choose to pretend to be Roach and answer him, though it's obvious he knows it's Jackie. Still, he gives away his location and invites him up to his office on the top floor of the building. After shooting his way through, Jackie will corner Dutch Oven Harry on the roof before he falls to his death two seconds later. Also, Uncle Polly blows up St. Mary's Orphanage for no beneficial or logical reasons outside of spiting his nephew. Jeez, what a dick. Hopping down into the train tracks, eating Dutch Oven Harry's heart will unlock the next Darkling, the Gunner. Wielding a minigun, it punctures as your long-range unit and one slightly more durable than the Berserker, if only because it doesn't have to walk right up to an enemy to kill them. They're also handy in spotting enemies you may not have noticed since they instantly aggro to them. Using it to stop the incoming subway train, Jackie will follow the tracks back to the subway station. Uncle Paulie's pretty much a scumbag. Not that anyone has the balls to tell him to his face. Paulie took me out of an orphanage I lived in after my parents died. It's kind of like being rescued from a shark attack by a grizzly bear. The only reason he took me in was because he needed another hitman. We never did see eye to eye. Calling up Jenny, she and Jackie will mourn the loss of their childhood home and agree to meet at Fulton Street to visit what's left of the orphanage and possibly offer some help. The place wasn't abandoned, by the way. There were kids still living there, along with the nun who ran the place, Sister Mary. A news broadcast will confirm that there were several casualties and that Sister Mary is still missing and presumably dead. Checking in with Uncle Polly, he angrily berates Jackie about hitting his business, gloating about blowing up the orphanage, and warning his nephew, more pain is coming his way. Super. Meeting up with Jenny, she's in the company of Jimmy the Grape, an old wise guy and associate of the Franchetti family. He and the older mafiosos are in agreement that something needs to be done about Polly. He suggests Jackie destroy the stash of money he's holding for the Chicago families. Asking Jimmy to look out for Jenny while he's gone, Jackie heads for Grinders Lane. Grinders Lane. This is the center of Paulie's operation. The place always makes me want to kick a fucking dog. Or something. What the hell does that even mean, Jackie? The place makes you want to kick a dog? I know I said I like them, but not all of his monologues are bangers. Or make sense for that matter. Paulie is keeping the money inside of his slaughterhouse which naturally is heavily guarded with tons of his goons. After getting inside, blasting my way through, getting distracted watching Flash Gordon, and then getting lost because I destroyed all the lights and didn't know where to go, I eventually found the money and set it ablaze. Alrighty, let's go check in with Jenny. Jackie, they snuck up on me and nailed me from behind. 
Pauly and that fucking piece of shit Eddie Schroed. Oh god damn it, Jimmy the Grape. You had one job. One. Racing to St. Mary's Orphanage, which a good chunk of managed to survive the bomb blast, we find the place devoid of usual guys working for Polly. Instead, we get apparitions slash flashbacks of a young Jackie and Jenny during their time together at the orphanage. Finally, finding Polly and Eddie Schrote, the corrupt police chief working with them, we thankfully arrive before they kill Jenny. Unfortunately, the darkness has other plans as it binds Jackie and forces him to watch what happens next. You caused me a lot of trouble, boy. You were my blood, Jackie. I loved you like a son, and you took from me. You stole my respect, and you stole my trust. And when blood takes from blood, someone always pays. So now, I take from you. Jackie, this is not your fault. Powerless to save the most important person in his life, consumed by despair, Jackie is unwilling to become a puppet of the darkness and chooses to end it all. the first time I died. When Jackie comes to, he finds himself in hell. Though instead of the usual fire and brimstone kind of hell, this place is a World War I battlefield in the midst of a fight between the Germans and the British. Huh. Maybe this is meant to be one of those personalized hell kind of deals? Though I'm not sure why this would be Jackie's personal hell? So it's time to look for some answers. Killing the demonic German soldier who tries attacking him and then consuming his heart, Jackie unlocks his next darkness ability, the Demon Arm, which allows him to instantly kill enemies by impaling them and yeeting them away. It also doubles as a quicker and easier way to take out light sources instead of shooting them. Proceeding through the trenches, Jackie will also unlock the next Darkling, the Kamikaze, can you guess what he does? That's right, he provides Jackie with a refreshing mixed drink made of vodka, lime juice, and orange liqueur. Oh, and he also explodes. He's my least favorite of the Darklings, since he'll usually get shot and blown up before ever actually getting close to enemies. He does manage to blow open a path for Jackie to continue his journey through the trenches though. Crossing the battlefield, we'll spot some demonic looking guys strung up and attached to makeshift wings. According to the darkness, that fellow is Pestilence, one of the four horsemen. Neat. After a very long section trudging through the battlefield and taking out a German bunker, Jackie spots the Union Jack over the horizon, arriving at a base controlled by the Allied forces. The lads here have seen better days, as while not completely demonic like the Germans, their faces are all scarred up and stitched together. The British soldiers don't offer much information on what the hell this place is, but tell Jackie he should go find an American soldier in a nearby village for help. Well, all right then, down the hatch we go. Traveling through the sewers, Jackie quickly arrives at the village. Walking around, he'll talk to more British troops and even stumble upon the next horseman, Famine. It's just an emaciated horse eating what looks like apples or baby tomatoes, I don't know. Heading to a church, Jackie will find the American soldier he's been looking for, and he's been expecting him too. Do I know you? My name is Tony Estacado. Okay, this is gonna sound weird, but I guess that I'm your great-great-grandfather. Great-great-grandpappy Tony lore dumps the origins of the darkness to Jackie, explaining he brought it into the Estacado family when he and his regiment discovered it during World War I. He goes over what I explained earlier about how it passes down through the generations and awakens on the firstborn male's 21st birthday. Tony explains this place isn't hell, but is actually some mental plane inside of the darkness's mind which has trapped him and the other soldiers here for who knows how long. Also implying that all of the hosts of the darkness will end up here after they die. However, Jackie isn't supposed to be here yet. 
Since he took his life before it was his time, the darkness brought his mind here while it works on putting his head back together in the real world. However, the fact that darkness couldn't stop Jackie in the first place has Tony thinking that his great-great-grandson might be able to take control of the demonic being, and potentially freeing everyone trapped here in its mind. He tells Jackie to seek out two weapons forged by a previous host that can help him take control of the darkness, and tells him to leave the village and head for the hills. And man, this was probably the section where I really wish Jackie could sprint, as this area is huge, is confusing to navigate, and is filled with undead German soldiers who don't stay dead, and will reanimate after a few seconds. Wandering around for a bit, we'll find a man who's been crucified upside down, going by the creative name of the Crucified. He's also apparently the third horseman, Death, and the previous Darkness host who forged the weapons that can control it. However, before he'll hand them over to Jackie, he needs to hear the secret password first. We've now unlocked our next ability, the Darkness Guns. Using Darkness instead of bullets for ammo, they do more damage, can permanently kill the undead soldiers, and the left pistol can fire a shockwave. While they'll allow Jackie to control the Darkness, the Crucified warns that it won't give him complete control, and if he's reckless, he'll go back to being the Entity's puppet. Despite having the guns, Jackie is still trapped here, so he heads back to Great Great Grandpappy Tony to ask what he should do next. He speaks of some cannon sitting outside an old castle that's heavily fortified, and he assumes it must serve some kind of importance to the darkness, since he has it so heavily defended. Alright then, let's see what this cannon thing is all about. Heading through the catacombs, we'll take out more undead German soldiers, but need to empty a water chamber in order to proceed. Running around and turning some valves to drain the water, Jackie will unlock his final darkling, the Light Killer. He shoots out electricity and will attack light sources for you. I'm kind of mixed on this guy. He's better than the kamikaze for sure, but he still needs to get kind of close to an enemy to attack them. That, and while it can be useful to send him out ahead of you to take out light sources, he only attacks one at a time and is pretty slow. So you can usually just use the demon arm to take out lights faster. Honestly, as a whole, the Darklings are kind of underwhelming. I feel like they would have been better utilized if they were used more often to get past obstacles or solve puzzles, which I thought was where they were going with them seeing as the introduction of each Darkling has them helping Jackie by removing whatever obstacle is impeding his progress. Oh well, maybe the sequel does it better. After emptying the water chamber and taking out some more undead Germans, Jackie will reach the cannon and the final horseman, War. Though this thing is less a cannon and more like a badass giant train, commandeering it from the Germans in the name of freedom and democracy. Just as Jackie starts heading down the tracks, the darkness is done putting them back together again, and Jackie returns to the real world. I fixed your broken head, Ball. You have passed my test. No more dreaming. Hopping off the subway train, Jackie's greeted by Jimmy the Grape. Quite some time has passed while he was trapped in World War I, and everyone assumed Paulie had him killed. Jimmy then lectures Jackie about how he made his poor Aunt Sarah sick with worry, and that she's been staying up every night waiting for him to come home. So before we can avenge Jenny's death, and put Uncle Paulie six feet under, we gotta go apologize to Aunt Sarah. My Aunt Sarah. Now she taught me about life. After I left the orphanage, she was the one person who cared for me, and she loved you. Now when her husband Jimmy Franchetti died, the family forgot about her, except for the older guys, and me. Checking in with Aunt Sarah, she's relieved to see Jackie alive, and she offers her condolences in losing Jenny, though she does also chastise him for not taking Jenny out of the city, and leaving the mob life behind ages ago. Still, Aunt Sarah understands this whole mess is Polly's fault, and gives her blessing for Jackie to take him out, and assures him the older mobsters will back him too. However, before he can take down Polly, he'll need to deal with his lapdog, the Chief of Police, Eric Schrote. 
She says his apartment is located in Gun Hill, and a guy named Abe Hunter will meet Jackie there to let him up to his apartment. Reaching Gun Hill, I find Abe, but the old man starts blasting and I end up killing him instead. Which, uh, apparently wasn't supposed to happen. I actually didn't realize this was Abe until I went back through my footage to write this part of the script. So I'm only just now realizing there wasn't a setup to him betraying Jackie or anything. Looking it up online, he really was supposed to just hand him the key, and I can't really find an answer for why he went hostile. My best guess is that maybe his AI turned screwy because the Darkling I summoned killed some innocent people just outside? If anyone's got some insight about this, let me know, and comment down below. Either way, I didn't softlock myself or have to reset, as I still got the key I needed off his corpse. Ascending up to Eddie's apartment, he takes off when spotting Jackie, and after chasing him up to the roof, I lose his trail when a police chopper starts shooting up the place. Once the helicopter is gone, I use some impromptu parkour to follow his trail to the police station, where the whole department is waiting for me. Fighting through a good chunk of New York's finest, I make it to the station roof just as Eddie gets into the chopper from before. Despite what I was initially assuming, this wasn't a boss fight that needed me to shoot down the helicopter. Instead, I'm supposed to jump off the roof before he wastes Jackie with a barrage of missiles. With Eddie having managed to escape for now, Jackie will call up Butcher to see if he has any ideas on how to hit him. Butcher suggests they get their hands on a suitcase Eddie is holding for Polly that has a lot of incriminating evidence inside using it to lure him to Jackie, and also planting a bomb inside to take out Eddie. The briefcase, along with all the contraband Eddie's crooked cops take for themselves, is in the old Turkish baths, which can only be reached by going through Old City Hall. Grabbing a hidden key from the public restroom, Jackie will use it to unlock the gate that will lead him to his next destination. Also, if you talk to this guy standing outside the gate, he'll ask if he can find his brother and talk him into coming back home. So remember to keep an eye out for that guy. This is City Hall. You know, it used to be a subway station. But it pretty much went to hell a few years ago. It's the only way through to where I need to go. Back to the motherfuckers who killed you. Exploring the abandoned subway tunnel, which is giving me some strong Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle 2 vibes, Jackie will bump into a pair of friendly hobos. They explain the path to the Turkish baths have been blocked, and that the cops have been roughing them up lately. Random question... But do you guys know the capital of Denmark? I told him it was Copenhagen. Actually, Emerson, it's Copenhagen, you idiot. No wonder your brother's leg got broken. Heading deeper into the tunnels, the hobos here are much less friendly and are apparently part of some satanic group. After a brief platforming challenge over some damaged pipes, electrified water, and poisonous gas, I'll face off against their leader. I think this was meant to be a sort of puzzle boss as the guy had set up several locks I had to break through, and had rigged up some exploding pipes. But the idiot just walked in front of his own trap and blew himself up. Oh well, that'll teach you to worship Satan. Devouring his heart, Jackie will unlock his final darkness ability, Black Hole. Which, you guessed it, creates a black hole that will suck up anyone dumb enough to get next to it, dragging their bodies around and crushing them. It's far and away Jackie's best ability, as it has some incredible range and can take out a group of enemies easy. They try to balance the power, as you need full darkness energy in order to do the most damage, and you'll become more vulnerable since you used up your darkness energy. However, it's stupidly easy to spam, as you can fire one off, hide behind cover while you regenerate the darkness, and then fire off another as soon as the first black hole is done. Due to how overpowered it is, combined with the darkness guns you unlocked earlier, you really don't need to bother using your regular guns anymore. I wouldn't say it trivializes combat, as it still is easy to get yourself killed, and in future fights you'll be thrown into bigger arenas, with enemies spread far from each other. Clearing a path ahead with Black Hole, we can now make our way to the Turkish Baths. Now I'm not going to dwell too much on this part due to how long it is, but it's more fights against the police, grabbing the briefcase, fighting SWAT, and avoiding the helicopter backing them up, returning to the old city hall tunnels to fight off the cops waiting to ambush me, and finally making it back to the subway station. Ah, fuck, I forgot to look for that guy's brother. Shit. Say, did you see my brother? Well, I saw him, but I think he's kind of reluctant to meet up with you. He's got serious people problems. Oh, my brother Ernie's always been the family freak. Hey, but thanks for trying. Here. Wait, what? When the hell did we see Ernie? Yeah, so I didn't realize this until I talked to Mitch but his brother Ernie was the leader of the Satanists. 
I was expecting him to just be some random non-hostile NPC standing around I had to talk to. As it turned out, I wasn't paying attention again, as Emerson will warn you about Duval's group when you head towards the Turkish Baths. So if I bothered to remember Mitch's last name, I would realize it was his brother who blew himself up trying to fight me. Well, whatever, I still completed the side quest either way. Briefcase in hand, I'll meet up with Butcher and he'll prep it with a bomb. Calling up Betty Schrode afterwards, he and Jackie agree to meet at the Trinity Church. As he arrives, the ghost of great-great-grandpappy Tony appears to him, reminding him he needs to come back to the other side to take complete control of the darkness. Seeing an opportunity to take out two birds with one bomb, Jackie plans to take himself out along with Eddie. Meeting with the corrupt police chief and setting his briefcase on the church altar, he predictably springs a trap and calls in a ton of SWAT to kill Jackie. Stupidly though, despite the fact he's learned about the darkness' weakness to light, he decides to shut off the lights in the church, effectively sending his men to the slaughter. Halfway through the fight, Eddie wises up and turns on some spotlights to try to limit Jackie's movement and actions, before just tossing a flashbang to bring an end to the battle. I get the feeling the sequence was originally just supposed to be Eddie pulling one over on Jackie, catching him off guard by exploding his weakness to light, but maybe the devs were worried it was a little boring and threw in another fight against the cops first. Otherwise, Eddie is just really stupid. Well, welcome back to the land of the living. But don't get used to it. Okay. Now, tell me. Who helped you out on the hit at the turkey's baths? Oh, what's the matter? Helpless without that screwy shit you've been pulling in the darkness? See what I mean about how characters are so passive about the existence of the darkness? despite seeing what Jackie can do? Like, Eddie, you just saw this guy tear your officers to shreds. Why the hell do you think anyone helped Jackie with the hit on the Turkish baths? Though he might be asking who told Jackie about them and the briefcase, and not necessarily who helped him kill all his officers. Eddie slaps Jackie around and performs some enhanced interrogation techniques on him using a drill. Meanwhile, his two flunkies standing guard are yucking it up, with Ear Boy over here mentioning something about Mother of God and a shipment coming into the city. Seriously, what is up with the size of his ears? This guy's design stands out like a sore thumb in comparison to every other character. Tied up and with the spotlights keeping him from summoning the darkness, how is Jackie Estacado going to get himself out of this one? It would take a miracle to get him out of here. Or just some dumbass standing in front of the light a little too long. No! And that, <laughs> that was the second time I died. Waking back up in World War I dreamland, Jackie finds himself in the control room of the war train, which is now parked in front of that castle that was mentioned earlier. Sid Castle is defended by biplanes that will kill Jackie if he tries to approach it on foot. I didn't realize it at first, but I had assumed that Cannon Train was meant to return Jackie to the real world. It wasn't until I was writing the script that I noticed he only came back because the darkness put his brains back together. As shown when it protested Jackie about to blow himself up with Eddie, it's been trying to avoid letting him come back here and getting back to the cannon. Using it will allow him to enter the castle and find whatever's in there to take full control of the darkness. Though we can't fire the cannon, as according to the undead guy laying beside it, Jackie needs to get a shell for it first. Heading back to the village, and then to the trenches, great-great-grandpappy Tony has a surprise waiting for us. A tank section. I'm kind of whatever with this tank section. It's pretty brief and not really all that difficult. I understand that since the inside of the darkness's mind is modeled after a World War I battle because that's when it was discovered and bonded with Tony, but it feels like I should be gunning down legions of flying demons or demonic brutes, not just undead soldiers in the planes and tanks they used back in the day. The game, somehow sensing my tiny complaint from the future, rectifies this issue when the Estacados arrive at the stronghold where the cannon shell is kept. After the tank they were riding in crashes, great-great-grandpappy Tony tries to find a way to free Jackie, but is attacked by something off-screen. 
It's a huge demonic leech thing. Which kindly frees Jackie by picking him up along with the tank. Cue a boss battle. Well, boss battle might be a little too generous here. Turret section is more accurate. As you just have to shoot the leech's face as it swings you around every now and then until it dies. Super underwhelming. Running over to Tony. He's been mortally injured and is about to die. Actually, wait, he's already dead. Won't he just, like, respawn or something since his spirit is trapped here forever? Hey, kid. I think I got it. That thing about the light and the darkness. You know what that means? Do not interfere. You know, if the darkness didn't want Tony to interfere, you'd think he would have sent him to the Shadow Realm way before he got into the tank, but whatever. Don't worry, great-great-grandpappy. I'll find the light in the darkness. I swear. Proceeding into the fortress, Jackie finds the cannon shell and then transports it back to the war cannon. The darkness, who up until now had been pretty smug about how he was in control and Jackie was nothing but his puppet, changes his tune, now begging Jackie to stop and not go through with loading the cannon. Breaching the castle walls and entering, this place was guarding the heart of the darkness. The place this creature is most vulnerable and where Jackie can take complete control of it. And where he can find the light within the darkness, which is in a room hooked up to a machine with four chairs. Jackie will have to approach each chair and use the contraptions attached to them to strip himself of his darkness abilities. Though the darkness has one last trick up its sleeve as it manifests itself as an evil version of Jackie, made of all the powers he stripped from himself. Lashing out, the darkness attacks him and will endlessly summon darklings to fight him. Cue another not boss section. Opening fire on his evil doppelganger, Jackie's guns are worthless. The spirit of Jenny will reach out and tell him not to fight the darkness and to find another way. I thought I had to look for something in the room or maybe destroy the machines that sucked up the dark energy out of Jackie but all you really have to do is walk up to him and accept the darkness into your heart, with Jackie forcibly absorbing the weakened monster and taking complete control. After being awakened by the ghost of child Jenny, Jackie finds himself back in the real world and outside St. Mary's Orphanage. Heading down into the subway, he bumps into Vinnie Mutarello, another older mobster who hates Polly, and gives out a side mission to track down and take out the Chicago mobsters hiding around the game. Vinnie explains that after Jackie blew up Eddie Schroep, Polly's operations have effectively nosedived, and the Chicago families are about to pull their support and money, leaving his uncle in a desperate situation. Or as Vinnie puts it, He's on his knees, ready to suck whatever dick he can so they won't freeze his assets. No one's sure where Polly is, and the only clue Jackie's got is what Schroet's flunkies mentioned before they blew up. Mother of God. Vinny doesn't know what that means, and says to go ask Butcher, as he usually knows something, and he's currently at Aunt Sarah's. I wasn't sure how to work this in organically, but this monologue Jackie has on his way to visit them is just too hilarious not to include. The mother of God thing was way too obvious. I figured it had to be something else. Now I knew that Aunt Sarah and Butcher were ready to see Schroet and Pauly's asses on a platter. I've already got an opening. Maybe they can help turn it into a gaping hole. God, his dialogue is so stupid at times, but I love it. Talking to Butcher, he explains mother of God is code for the Santa Maria a boat owned by the Chicago families. If Jackie shoots it up, the Chicago families will sever ties with Polly, losing their protection and letting Jackie take him out with no repercussions. I guess the plan to have them whack him is off the table then. In order to reach the boat, Jackie will first have to go back to Grinder's Lane and use the radio outside the slaughterhouse to call it into port. 
Afterwards, he can find the ship anchored at Pier 19. Shooting through the crew and killing the captain, it's mission accomplished. However, Polly has finally wised up to the fact that the older crew were supporting Jackie and taking him out. So he sent his goons to Aunt Sarah's place to kill her, Butcher, and all the others. Arriving to back them up, this section's kinda tedious and probably where I died the most in the game. For whatever reason, despite the fact Jackie is in complete control now, the darkness refuses to spawn and use its power. I forgot to mention it, but there are certain places in the game where you can't use the darkness. Mainly Jenny's place, the subway, and Aunt Sarah's. With the flimsy excuse that it hates being around innocence. Which was probably the game's lazy way of hiding its existence from anyone Jackie isn't in the middle of killing. This puts us in a situation where we have to deal with the almost endless amount of Uncle Polly's goons without our best weapons. Instead, we're stuck inside Aunt Sarah's place and relying on the game's so-so shooting. And because of all the open windows, and where you're being shot from, it's very easy to get killed fast if you're not paying attention when a new enemy spawns in a different area. Like I said, this isn't frustratingly hard, but it just feels tedious because of how long it goes on, and how useless the older crew are in helping you. After successfully protecting the old crew, or most of them anyways, Jimmy the Grape thanks Jackie, and says after speaking to the other mobsters, they want him to take over the family after killing Uncle Polly. Which you can choose to accept or refuse, it doesn't change the ending or anything. Speaking to Butcher, He's learned where Polly is hiding, at a lighthouse on an island a few miles offshore. He has a guy waiting for Jackie at Pier 19 to take him there when he's ready. This is your last chance to take care of any unfinished side missions, or to go back for any missed collectibles, as once Jackie gets on that boat, there's no going back as we head towards the finale of the game. End of story. Except I'm not the one lining up for the last rites. It's my loving Uncle Paulie. He knows the end of the story as well as I do. But he don't like it as much. You know what I say to that? Fuck him. Unlike the rest of the game, this is the only section that takes place during the day. I forgot to mention it, but after Jackie spoke to Vinny in the subway, he mentioned he felt something coming, that the air felt strange, and wondered if it had to do with an eclipse mentioned on the news. Said eclipse begins as he arrives at Polly's Island, allowing Jackie to use the darkness during the day, slowly growing stronger as more of the sun gets obscured. However, this increase in strength comes at a cost. As the darkness is slowly regaining control the more Jackie kills and gives into his anger, which comes to a head when he arrives at Polly's mansion, and easily slaughters everyone inside, his power is now supercharged. Unfortunately, the way the game presents this scene is awkward, as instead of a god mode power boost where you're untouchable while you're using these beefed up powers, it's more like slightly interactive cutscenes, with the game flashing between different areas of the mansion as Jackie goes on a rampage. While a bit disappointing, the way his rampage comes to an end is pretty chilling. All the control of the place is mine. We are the stuff of Ascending the lighthouse, Jackie will confront Polly and finally get his vengeance. But in doing so, he's doomed his soul to be consumed by the darkness. Listen, Jackie, I've been thinking, I, I know this worked out bad for both of us, but this store needs to be rash here. Why don't you fucking listen to me, you piece of shit? When he dies, I own you. I hope you rot in hell forever! There's always a little light in the darkness. Didn't I tell you so, sweets? Jenny? 
We get one moment, Jackie. It's all they can allow. What? Who? Just one moment. Just to say goodbye. You were everything to me. And all I ever did was kill you. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I can't forgive you, Jackie. How can I forgive you when it wasn't your fault? You have to go now. I don't want to go. I want to stay here with you. I know. Am I dreaming? Yes. You have to wake up now. Wake up. And that was the darkness. Overall, I had a pretty good time. I enjoyed the story. Jackie Estacado is a compelling lead. And his darkness abilities are unique enough to help it stand out in a generation filled with tons of first-person shooters. While it's not completely faithful to the source material, I think it's to its benefit, as it keeps the story tight and avoids overwhelming players with introducing all these other cosmic entities and lore. The game can also be comfortably beaten in about 10 hours so it doesn't outstay its welcome. It's not without its issues, of course. Like I said, the shooting feels lackluster compared to other titles. While the darkness abilities are fun, I wish you got more utility out of them, maybe getting more uses in the overworld, or letting them get stronger and function differently as your darkness level increases. For example, being able to pull off the cool feats like using the demon arm to attack multiple enemies at once, or a super-powered black hole that can clear an entire room. Same goes for the Darklings, which feel underpowered compared to the regular darkness abilities. Most of the side characters were pretty cool, though I wish Jenny stuck around longer in the plot. She's killed off like three hours into the game, we only learn more about her through the flashbacks to her childhood with Jackie. Maybe a side mission or two where you gotta spend time with her or do a favor could have fleshed her out some more before she died. Oh, and I didn't know where to put this in but uh, Darkness has a multiplayer mode. I don't actually know if the servers are still active, as I couldn't connect to one, but it seems that players can still host matches with their friends. I didn't get to try it out myself, but from the footage I found, it looks like a blast. I'm eager to see how the sequel improves on the original. Looking around, most critics gave the Darkness 2 similar or slightly better scores than the first game. Fan opinion seems to be the same. The sticking point seems to be the change in studio and graphics, but I don't know, I dig the cel shaded look. Hopefully I'll get around to playing it and giving my thoughts on it soon. Thanks for watching, and special thanks to my Tier 2 channel members with their names displayed on screen right now. So I'm almost done with Persona 3 Reload and Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth. Chances are by the time this video is live, I should be done with Persona. I don't want to bog down this outro with my thoughts on them, but I've really enjoyed both games. I only bring them up as they're basically been the only things I've been playing for the last few months outside of stuff for the channel. It'll feel good to finally get them done and free up my time to go back to some other games I've had on the back burner, like Baldur's Gate 3. Was debating playing Dragon's Dogma 2 next, but I want to wait till those technical issues got ironed out on PC. I think I might buy Stellar Blade though. The demo was pretty good, and the game is overall visually impressive. Insert obvious joke here. I've got a list of what games I want to do videos on for the channel this month, and I'm currently playing through the next game. I won't say what it is, as I'm running into some issues with the game crashing a lot, so if I can't sort it out, I might change to a different game first. Keep an eye on the community tab for the usual announcement on what it is. I'm finally starting to build a good routine that lets me efficiently balance my personal life and work for the channel, which hopefully means I'll be able to stick to a more reliable release schedule. While new videos have been releasing pretty consistently so far this year, there were several times where I dropped the video days later than I wanted to. I'm doing my best to avoid the usual YouTuber burnout, but I still feel like I could be more productive than I am now. Again, thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like and comment down below. Have you ever read the Darkness comics? 
Did you enjoy them at all? Which game do you think is better, the first or the second? Tell me your thoughts down below. And if you're new to the channel, I'd love it if you subscribed. If you want more of my content to watch, check out the recommended video here at the end, or the playlist of all the videos I've done on the Grand Theft Auto series. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.